Hope maybe you can just dis discuss this in the break. Welcome. Um, so, uh, my name is Philip Kamalander. I guess you have seen me already in the first uh, week, maybe. I'm taking over now for the next five weeks from Ralph. And the first topic that we're going to tackle is uh, generalized Bell inequalities, which is happening in the, in the area of non-locality. Um, so I wrote down my email address, but of course the preferred way of reaching me would be again via the Moodle forum. I'm not sure if this has been used, I guess not so intensely so far, but okay. Maybe that's going to start later. Um, before we go into the, the main topic of today, I would like to emphasize as well that I have uploaded uh, the first chapter of the script about what we discussed today, tomorrow, and probably in the beginning of next week to Moodle already. So you can find the script there. And we will more or less follow it closely. Good. So um, non-locality. What, what, is, what is quantum non-locality or non-locality in general? The idea of this topic is to try to understand and quantify quantum non-locality, which is sort of a thing that, that can be cast in terms of correlation. So you have, for instance, two parties, and they are correlated somewhat in a way stronger than what is classically possible. And our, our goal is to understand what does it mean, stronger than classical, and how can we quantify it? Are there even stronger correlations than quantum, or are there different quantum correlations that are not as strong, so one is not as strong as the other one, and so on. So this is... This is the goal of, of, of the first part of the five weeks that I'm going to take over of this uh, course. Um, and yeah, as I said, so we will also open the, 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 um, the discussion to stronger than quantum correlations. Um, not today, though, but maybe tomorrow. And uh, we will in particular then move on towards the sort of, sort of geometry of correlations, sort of a way of depicting different sets of correlations in a very formal way. So it's uh, now when I say correlations, it's probably uh, still an informal term, but we will make it formal today. And then we will be able to talk about the geometry of correlations, which is then going to be the part of next and probably the third week. Um, good. So let's start. Please tell me if my writing is too small uh, or if it's not readable. I'm happy to, to work on that. So the title is Generalized Bell Inequalities. Um, and the idea to formalize the, the topics and the concepts that I try to motivate to you now in a few words is to phrase the problem as a game, and then look at the winning probability of this game, which will tell us exactly what is the main object we should consider, and how can we work with it, tweak it, so we can learn a lot about these non-locality uh, topics. So the idea is to um, um, consider non so-called non-local games. Okay, and, and the first game, which is also the main game that we will consider as our main example, is the so-called CHSH game. So let me um, define the game, let me define its rules, and then we dive into its analysis. The game is essentially a game of two parties, Alice and Bob, and they collaborate. So they, they work together. They want to work together, and they either win together or they lose together. And then there is a referee, and the referee sort of decides whether they win or lose. Um, the referee initially sends two questions, one of them to Alice, one of them to Bob, and we give these questions names. X from some alphabet curly X for Alice, Y for some alphabet curly Y to Bob. And then Bob and Alice individually send their answers, A for Alice from some alphabet A, and B for Bob 
to the referee. So we have questions and answers. A and B are answers. And importantly, so there, there are some rules, right? We need to say when they win, when they lose, and so on. Um, well, let me go to the next panel then here. So the alphabets are essentially arbitrary in general, but in our case, for the CHSH game, we choose them to be sort of the, the most trivial case. So we have the, them all the same, and they are all the set 0, 1. So questions are 0, 1, answers are 0 and 1. Now to the rules of the game. Um, so first of all, before I say when they win or lose, let me state some more, more basic rules that, that are very important for this game to make sense in the, in the context of non-locality. So first of all, I said Alice and Bob, they co cooperate. And um, they may agree on a strategy beforehand. So they, they may have met beforehand, before the game starts, and, and agree on how they react given some questions X and for Alice and Y for Bob. So they may... agree on a strategy beforehand. Um, but importantly, so that what makes the game sort of first of all, local, is um, that no communication is allowed during the game. So, of course, between the referee and Bob and the referee and Alice, yes, because they send questions and answers back and forth, but not between Alice and Bob. And that's important because it tells us, in particular, that um, Alice must not know the question of Bob. And likewise, Bob must not know the question of Alice. Okay, so the questions are really only distributed to to one of the players. So I'm trying to make this clear by drawing sort of a, a wall here. So little y and little x are the, quest the actual questions that are set, sent here in one instance. And then, of course, there can be different questions in different rounds. Um, yeah, so now to these questions. So the referee sends, um, so the questions are distributed randomly, uniformly random. So P, X, Y, so this is sort of the, the distribution. So now little x, little y are the actual questions. Capital X, capital Y are the random variables modeling these questions. <clears throat> and they should be uniformly random. In this game, huh? that's just a CHSH game. And what we also learn from, from this in particular is that X is independent from Y for this game. So now I do not no longer mean the the lowercase x and y, but now I mean the random variables x and y. Random variable x is independent from random variable y. So that means essentially that the product distribution factorizes. Um, let me know if you feel very uncomfortable with, with one of the concepts I'm using. Well, maybe not up, up to now, but maybe later on I'm using other concepts. So let me know if you think I should explain some of the concepts, like random variable or like independence or or other things. Good, so now to the winning condition. Uh, 
um, which is also specific to this game. Alice and Bob win if and only if the following holds. A plus B modulo 2 must not be equal to X times Y. That is the winning condition. So as a list, maybe to make this a bit more obvious in this specific case, we have x, y here, so they can either be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. And the winning condition is then here, a must not be equal to b, same here and also in the third line. But if x and y are both 1, then a should be equal to b. <clears throat> All right. Um, so this is the setting. Any questions about the, the setting of the CHSH game so far? It's a two-party, two-player game with two possible, with two inputs and two outputs, one of them to each, and each input and output has two options, zero or one. They may cooperate, they may not communicate. Uh, during the game, the questions are distributed uniformly, and the winning condition is this specific condition that, that we consider here. I'd like to make a few... Yes? The truth table. Yes, so, so, so this O plus here is um, addition modulo 2, right? So if, if A and B are the same, either 0 or 1, then this left-hand side is going to be 0. Um, and otherwise, it's going to be 1. If either of them is 1 and the other one is 0. Now, if one of x or y are 0, their product is going to be 0, so a must not be equal to b. That's the three conditions here. And if both are 1, this is going to be 1. So in order to fulfill this inequality here, a must be equal to b. Yeah. Good. Now, the, what, what will come out of this game is the CHSH inequality, which is one specific instance of a Bell inequality. And it's essentially going to bound the winning probability of local classical strategies. Now, um, the title of, of this part of the lecture is called Generalized Bell Inequality. So maybe we should already now start to think about how to generalize this setting. And I think there are obvious ways of doing this. So when we, when we sort of want to understand why, why, why the topic of the, of the lecture is Generalized Bell Inequalities, you could first of all think of, say, more parties. So generaliza possible generalizations. So more parties, obviously, is a one way of generalizing it, which would then, of course, have an influence on the winning condition. You could work, uh, work on here. Uh, so yeah, different alphabets. And then some rules should stay the same and some rules should not stay the same. So, for instance, the, the cooperation should stay. So they are somehow given by this, by this whole non-locality area. So they should stay the same. Or at least more or less the same. In particular, there should not be any communication between Alice and Bob during the game. But you could also work on here. And you could have different, different distributions. This, yeah, this doesn't make sense. Mm. Not sure if you can read this, but okay, you get the idea, right? You could have the questions distributed differently, and of course you can have different winning conditions. And I'm no longer going to use the blue pen from now on. So there are obvious ways of generalizing this setting that change the game, the rules of the game to some extent, and then you can still ask the same question um, that we're going to ask next. <clears throat> so the question is, what is the winning probability of this game depending on the strategy? Depending on the strategies. 
of Alice and Bob. In order to treat this um, in, a, in a more or less nice notation, I'd like to introduce a new object that casts all the information in the winning probability in a nice way, sort of a Q factor. Q of A, B, X, and Y is defined to be 1 if the winning condition is fulfilled and 0 otherwise. So 1 if the winning condition is fulfilled and 0 otherwise. And I'm doing this because <coughs> now I can define the winning probability. Well, not define, but I. this is just by definition of, of Q. This is the expectation value of Q. And the expectation value of Q, um, well, you know, this is some overall possible <coughs> um, values of the random variables. And then we have the distribution. So that's just the definition of the expectation value. Um, and here now I also introduced random variables for the answers of Alice and Bob. And I call them A, capital A, and capital B. <coughs> and I can. Um, by Bayes' rule, I can always write this total probability distribution as um, probability distribution of x and y at x and y times the conditional probability distribution of a, b given x and y. So that's the same, that's Bayes', Bayes law. Again, times the Q factor. And this is a very convenient way of writing the winning probability because now we can start to investigate what is given by the game and what is the object that we can work with to, to get different winning probabilities depending on different strategies. So essentially, what is the mathematical object that defines the strategy? And here it's quite obvious because the distribution of the questions, P, X, Y, as well as the winning probability, they are given by the rules. I have defined them as part, being part of the rules. So they are given by the rules. So the only thing that we can actually work with here is this conditional probability distribution, P, A, B, given X, Y. So this is the object of interest. This is the object, the mathematical object, if you want, that contains all the relevant information about the strategy. Um, and this object has different names, so conditional probability distribution. Um, Obviously, that's what it is formally, but this is very often just called the correlations between Alice and Bob. It's a bit an informal way of calling it, but I will, I will, I will also use this word quite often. So this is also um, known as the correlations between Alice and Bob. Um, is, is it clear, like formally, what a conditional probability distribution is? That's clear to everyone. Okay. So um, then I'm not going to write it down, but I'm just going to say it. So these are, um, this is a function of four inputs, A, B, X, and Y. The function is non-negative, so it can never be negative. And if you sum over X and Y, you get one independent of A and, no, sorry, if you sum over A and B, sorry, if you sum over A and B, 
it must be normalized to one independent of x and y. So for each given x and y, summing up the probabilities must give unity. Okay. Good. So now we are a step further in formalizing our understanding of correlations. Now I can use the term correlations because I have defined by correlations, I essentially speak about the conditional probability distribution. Um, so now we can investigate the questions, uh, the question that I that I've raised on top. What is the winning probability um, given on a different strategy? Well, I have given the strategy, I have, I have defined the winning probability, so the next question would then be, what values can the winning probability take? And if you sort of naively define the rules of the game, not in the way that we have done it, but you tweak, you play, you play around with the winning condition and so on, then typically you can have a winning probability between zero and one. Everything is reachable, even if Alice and Bob just decide on their output given, given the question. Um, but of course, the game that I was presenting you here is um, phrased in a way such that, depending on the resources that are available, the winning probabilities are somehow bounded, so you would not always be able to reach a unit winning probability, even if you, even if you have uh, actually access to quantum resources. So that the resources, the resources, they do play a big role in, in answering this question, and now we're going through different types of resources and see what the winning probability is going to be for the different strategies. Good, so we start with sort of the easiest case, which is the classical deterministic strategies. <clears throat> what does that mean? Classical, um, well, classical deterministic strategies, I could also call them local deterministic strategies. The idea is that Alice gets her question and then she decides on her output deterministically given the question. So essentially, there is a function that tells her, given x, what is your output a? That is classically deterministic. And the same for Bob, of course. So Alice and Bob have a deterministic way of determining x, uh, a and b given x and y. And in particular, they do so locally. Huh? I mean, that's sort of implied, but I, it's good to emphasize this. So that means A is some function of x, and B is some other function of y. And since our alphabets are chosen in a very simple way, there are not so many options uh, of, of, for f and, and, and g. So there are actually only four options. Um, let me number them. So we have F1, that's the identity, for instance, that's one way. So A equals X, or F2, which is sort of the opposite. A is not X, so that means we have X plus one modulo two. And then we have the other candidates, which are erasing the bit to zero or to one. So the, the last, so actually I should maybe write it like this. So the last uh, two options, F3 and F4, are the constant functions when Alice would output zero or one independently of her question. Good. And of course, the same for G, right? So there, uh, G also has uh, four options. Now, to understand a bit better what this means, let's, let's look at the specific example. And let's choose A to be F1 of X. So A is equal to X, so the identity function. And likewise, B is G1 of Y. So again, B is also equal to Y. So what, what probability distribution do we get from this? Um, 
or in, what type of correlations, maybe we should ask ourselves this. So what type of correlations, P, A, B given X, Y, do we get from this? So um, first of all, it has to be deterministic. So a deterministic distribution is a distribution that is either zero or one, but nothing in between. Uh, nothing, that, so there is no randomness there. Um, now, the distribution should be zero whenever A is not equal to X and whenever B is not equal to G. And it should be one otherwise. So this correlations or conditional distributions can be written as delta of A X times delta of B Y in this case. <coughs> so deterministic means P A B given X Y takes values in zero and one. but not anything else. Now for this specific example, um, let's calculate the winning probability. In principle, all is there, right? We have the distribution of the questions, we have the, the, the Q factor of the winning condition, and now we also have an expression for this distribution, so there, there would be an easy way of calculating this sum of 16 terms, most of which are going to be zero. Um, but we can also have a look at it differently in terms of this table. And I'd like to do this because that's going to be actually quite helpful when we go to the more general case. So I can list X and Y, so the possible questions, and then see in which cases we win and in which cases we do not win. And here it's, it's not a probabilistic thing because we speak about deterministic strategies, right? So either we win or we don't win. In the general case, when you have probabilistic strategies, you can say here, in this case, I would win with, I don't know, 80%. In another case, I would win with 7%, whatever. So um, we have this list again. Now, with the specific strategy of this example, if x and y are both 0, then a and b are also going to be both 0. So a plus b is going to be 0. If x and y are 0 and 1, then A and B, which is the same as X and Y, are going to be 1, likewise 1 and 0, and likewise, um, uh, well, not likewise. So if X and Y are both 1, this means that A is 1 and B is 1, so their sum modulo 2 is again going to be 0. <coughs> so we see that the strategy... So remember that the winning condition is x times y must be different from a plus b. So we do not win if x and y are both 0. But in the other cases, they are all different. So here we win, and we win, and we win. Obviously, given that these, these questions are distributed uniformly, we have 25% lose, 25 plus 25 plus 25 win, so we have the winning probability of 75% in this case. <coughs> okay, so is this good? Is this bad? Um, it's certainly not too bad. You could definitely do worse in an obvious way. So for instance, one way of seeing that you can definitely do worse is choosing, say, the g function to be not. So instead of y equals b, you would have b equals y plus 1, so exactly the opposite. What would happen is that these numbers would flip here, so we'd have 1, 0, 0, 1. And then you would only win in the first case and lose in all the others. So you'd have a winning probability of 25%. So you can definitely do worse. Um, can you also do better? No. And now we'll see, we'll see why. So that's the next step to understand why this is actually optimal for classical deterministic strategies. So for classical deterministic strategies, the winning probability is upper bounded by 75%. Cool. 
Um, the proof here is rather simple. We find a way of proving that whatever, um, whatever functions f and g you use, there are 16 possibilities, right? But whatever you do, you can at most satisfy three out of the four conditions. Just like it was the case in this example, but we now prove this in, in general. So, so another way would be to go through all the 16 combinations and check. That's, that's another easy, but more or less um, naive way. Okay, so um, the claim is essentially that only three out of four conditions can be satisfied simultaneously. Um, as we will show now. So um, I have a very specific way of going through the different types of questions and then showing that um, if three of the questions lead to a win, then the fourth has to lead to a lose. So we start with the question x, y being one, zero. What is the winning condition? The winning condition is that x times y, so zero, must not be equal to a plus b which is by assumption that we have a classically deterministic strategy, f of x plus g of y. Okay, And f of x plus g of y is non-zero if and only if they are different. So g of 0 is not equal to f of 1, because x is 1 and y is 0 in this condition. Um, next, we have a look at x, y being actually 1, 1. So the winning condition here is that 1 must not be the same as a plus b, which is f of, in this case, I can already put it in, f of 1 plus g of 1. And this is the case if and only if f of 1 is equal to g of 1. And then the third type of question we look at is x, y being 0, 1. So again here, 0 must not be equal to f of 0 plus g of 1, which is the case if and only if g of 1 is not equal to f of 0. So assuming that all these winning conditions are fulfilled, this would already give us a winning probability of 75%. What would be the implication? So this implies that I'm just going through these um, inequalities and equalities. So g of 0 is not equal to f of 1, but this is equal to g of 1, which is then again not equal to f of 0. So in total, we see that g of 0 would have to be equal to f of 0 in this case. Because there, there are only two options, right? 0 or 1. But then, for the question x, y being 0, 0, the condition would be 0 not being equal to f of 0 plus g of 0 which is in contradiction with them being equal. Yes? Um, okay, so, so I think I should repeat the question for the, the audience, right? So the question is, how, where does this winning condition come from? Um, um, yes, so I think I will answer this question in the second half of today's lecture, when we connect 
well, what I will call the, the, the version of the CHSH inequality in this gain formulation with the usual CHSH inequality, then you will see that this winning condition is exactly giving us the usual CHSH inequality in the formulation in which, for instance, um, yeah, Klaus, Horn, uh, Shimoni, and Holt have phrased it. So that's the connection. And then I'm, I'm sort of transferring this question to why <laughs> did they come up with the random variables the way they did? Um, well, they were just clever and found something that separates classical from quantum correlations. But, but I agree that at the moment um, the winning condition looks somewhat arbitrary. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> now, this is, this is done with um, deterministic strategies, right? So I only allowed deterministic ways of of um, determining A from X and B from Y. But I'm, of course, not limited to this. I could also allow for strategies that probabilistically determine Alice's answer A from her input X and Bob's answer B from his input Y. And um, so this is a claim that I'm not going to prove explicitly because I would argue that the proof, so the I'm now going to claim claim two, and there's later on going to be a claim three, and claim three implies claim two, okay? So I'm just going to state it here, um, and I invite you to do the proof yourself of claim two, or convince yourself that claim three that I'm going to state in the second uh, hour of the day is actually implying claim two. So claim two is, even with probabilistic classical strategies, so that is strategies of the following form. We have Alice's output A given her question x is not deterministically de depending on x, but it may probabilistically depend on x. So this can be written as with some probability pi, she goes for a deterministic strategy delta a and f of x. And then we can sum over all possible um, deterministic strategies with some probabilities pi. And likewise, pb given y would be the same with some different probabilities qi. So these would be probabilistic classical strategies. And from this we would then determine the correlations pab given xy as the product. So this would be PA given X times PB given Y, okay? So even with probabilistic classical strategies, the winning probability is still upper bounded by 75%. Um, and as I said, so the proof either for, for you <laughs> or the other option is once we have stated and proved claim three in the next part of this lecture, then convince yourself that it implies claim two actually. Good. Questions so far? I'm also happy to maybe, if you have an idea of how to prove it, I'm happy to discuss this with you in, in the break quickly. Okay, now I need to clean. So I'm not going to clean. Hmm. 
Um, no, actually, I am going to clean that part as well. I'm just going to draw it again slightly differently. So the next part, the next step, is a sort of an intermediate step between between what we have done so far with um, classical and deterministic, or even classical and probabilistic strategies and quantum strategies, because there is another classical resource that we might allow Alice and Bob to use. Um, and at first sight, it's not clear whether this new classical resource would give them more power, in particular would allow them to have a higher winning probability than 75%. Um, and then what we will show is that even this new classical resource will not allow them to go beyond this bound. And the new classical resource that we are going to allow is called shared randomness. So the next um, type of strategies that we consider is classical strategies with shared randomness. So what is shared randomness? I'm going to draw the setting again, which is why I erased it, because it's going to be here again in a second. So the referee still sends questions Y and X to Alice and Bob. They send back answers A and B. Um, and still, they, they are not allowed to communicate, and they can agree on a strategy beforehand. But what is new is that in addition to the referee sending questions x and y, they have another random variable that we call lambda, which produces a value, lowercase lambda. And this lowercase lambda is sent to both Alice and Bob. And they may use this lambda to determine the output value that they are using. Okay? So this lambda could, for instance, be perfectly correlated. It could be always the same for Alice and Bob, say with 50% 0, with 50% 1, with 50% 2, with 50% 3, arbitrary alphabet actually. Um, so Alice and Bob may make use of an additional random variable or input Um, that is available to both. And of course, now they can make their outputs A and B as random variables may now also depend on lambda and not just on the questions x and y. Um, so this lambda, the random variable lambda, is distributed, well, some probability distribution, essentially arbitrary. Um, actually, I would say this, this might be part of the strategy. So they might agree on some give and some di probability distribution they think is optimal for them to win in this game. And typically, lambda is chosen to be discrete. Yes, but even if you, even if you allow it to be a continuous alphabet, it's also fine. Um, for what we do here in this course with non-locality, all the alphabets are always going to be discrete because then we do not have to care about sneaky stuff with integrals and measures and so on. And we don't want to make it more complicated than it is. We want to focus on the concepts and not on the technicalities. All right, let's take a break. I was told the break is going to be five minutes only. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, so we stopped...
at the definition of what shared randomness is. So shared randomness is essentially another value that is distributed to both Alice and Bob according to some distribution that may be fav favorable for them to win the game. And the question is now, can they make use of this shared randomness to, to, to do better than the 75% winning probability? In order to understand this a bit better, we need to first see how this affects the correlations. So the correlations are now of the following form. Um, so we are caring about the conditional distribution PAB given XY of some values AB XY. Um, and well, we now have this additional um, random variable. Okay, and it takes some values, but essentially this is not relevant here, so we sort of trace it out if you want. So this means uh, we take the marginal distribution of the total distribution, including lambda, and then uh, the marginal is calculated by summing over all possible values of lambda. And then we have the classical strategies that we had before, but now these may also depend on lambda. And like before, we also have Bob's strategy may now also depend on lambda. So what these correlations are essentially is they are a convex combination of the classical strategies that we have investigated already. Okay. So this is a convex combination. Of classically. Now um, to be to be precise, I could even say classically deterministic strategies, because that is the thing that we have actually considered and proved, not using claim two at the moment. Because later on I was trying to argue that you can deduce claim two from claim three, so I better not use claim two in claim three. So these are now the deterministic strategies, um, but of course the functions f and g may now not only depend on the questions x and y, but also on this additional um, shared random variable lambda. So these are, these are deterministic strategies. And of course, still local decisions, right? Alice has to decide only given X and lambda, but nothing about, about uh, Bob's question and vice versa. Um, and what is also, I, I think I didn't say this here. Ah, that's actually quite important. So it is not stated explicitly, but, but it is assumed that this random variable lambda is independent from the questions, right? Because this should, this should respect the rules of the game. Of course, if you introduce a shared, a new random variable lambda that doesn't respect the rules of the game, then suddenly the game changes. And the rules of the game are in particular that Alice does not know Bob's question and Bob does not know Alice's question. And it, so from what I have said so far, I have not ruled out that lambda might be correlated with the questions X and Y in such a way that if you know lambda, you automatically know both questions. And if you know both questions, the game is not fun anymore. So lambda, in order for it to respect the rules of the game, um, lambda must, must be independent from, from uh, x and y. And that is to say that, so one way of saying this is that um, the probability distribution of lambda conditioned on x and y is the same as the probability distribution of lambda. It's just not influencing um, the probability distribution of lambda. Right? And the rule that, that would be violated if this was not the case would be the rule that Alice only knows her question and Bob only knows his question. That's quite important. <coughs> Good, so now we have an explicit form of the correlations for this 
type of setting with additional shared randomness. Now we can phrase claim three, which is that this doesn't help. <laughs> So claim three, and this is essentially a version of the CHSH inequality. Um, classical for classical deterministic strategies. With shared randomness. We still have the winning probability upper bounded by 75%. Let's prove this, and the proof is very easy. And this is due to this very easy form of this um, conditional distribution, right? We know very well what happens if we have deterministic strategies. And what we do here is we have a convex combination of deterministic strategies that are local. So we use this fact together with the fact that the winning probability depends linearly on this conditional probability distribution. So we just calculate the winning probability of this strategy. It can be written as the sum over lambda, sum over a and b, and the sum over x and y. Now, p lambda times p x y times p a given x and lambda times p b given y and lambda. Ah, oh, times the Q factor. Right. Um, and it's the most naive way of bounding this. The goal is to show an upper bound, right? So the most naive way of bounding a convex combination is to say, we just maximize over the variable lambda and take the maximum value that we have. If we have a convex combination of probabilities that we would like to maximize, we just take it can obviously be upper bounded by the maximum value that, of the probabilities that you have there, and then you, you only do this strategy, and this dominates the convex combination. So it's sort of a union bound. So you max over lambda, okay, a, b, x, y, p, x, y, and the rest is exactly the same. Um, but the good thing about this is that we know what values this guy can take. This is what we've done in claim one. So claim one tells us that this is smaller than or equal to 75%. And that's it. Now, yes, question, yes. Okay, so, so what we have here is we have, these are the strategies we know well, the classical deterministic strategies without shared randomness. And now we, depending on lambda, we go for different of the different strategies, and we weigh these strategies with a probability, so that is a, a real number between zero and one. Um, and instead of summing over the real numbers between 0 and 1 times the winning probability of the strategies we know well, we can also say, well, this is certainly less than or equal to the best possible strategy of these possible strategies given lambda, and then we maximize over this so to get the best possible. And what we know from claim 1 is that even the best possible strategy still uh, has a winning probability of at most 75%, so if you maximize, you will never get beyond that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, so this, this idea of using uh, the, essentially the union bound is also what you would be using to prove claim two explicitly. So claim two being the statement about the winning probability without shared randomness, but allowing non-deterministic 
strategies for Alice and Bob. Um, and essentially, what, what this tells you is that in the, in the CHSH game, randomness is not really helpful, classical randomness is not really helpful for winning the game. So neither, neither for uh, shared randomness nor for randomness in determining Alice's and Bob's output given their, given their question. So classical randomness. is not helpful. OK. Um, so that there, in principle, there are two ways now to continue. Uh, so that one obvious way to, would be to say, all right, we now know what classical strategies with shared randomness can do. And then let's have a look at the quantum strategies. And we will do so later, and in particular, you will do so on, in the exercises of this week. Um, but the other way would be to sort of broaden the scope now, because so what I've done so far in the first hour is I've only talked about a specific game. And uh, I've used the terms local and classical and strategy and probabilities and so on, but I sort of haven't really connected this idea to um, other terms that are floating around, like local realism and so on. So I'd, I'd rather do this now, and then later on we go to the quantum strategies. Because um, distributions of the type that we have here, so distributions, or also correlations, as we call them now, of the form PAB given XY, can be written as a convex combination of local distributions. So that means a convex combination of distributions of the form A given x and lambda times distribution over B given y and lambda. They are called uh, distributions that allow for a so-called local hidden variable model. That's a very that's a central term for for our investigations this and next week. Local hidden variable model. So I should explain a bit why why uh, why it's called like this. Oh, by the way, this is abbreviated LHV model. So LHV is what we will be concerned with quite quite a lot. Um, why local hidden variable model? So, um, lambda, what I called shared randomness before, would be this hidden variable. And people started introducing this, trying to explain correlations that are there, but you don't really know how they came about. So one naive way of, of explaining correlations would be to say, aha, uh -huh, well, maybe there is some variable in, 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 in the model or, or in nature, lambda, that, that is there and that helps two parties to be correlated, maybe more than we would expect, um, but we don't know about it. So this is why, we called it a, why people called it a hidden variable model. So, so this may... Um, is uh, so is is used so so sort of used to explain or to try maybe I should say that to try to explain correlations of a certain type. So, for instance, if you um, if you know that uh, classical strategies without shared randomness can not win this game with higher probability than 75%, but you see in practice that you find, a, find two 
two strategies or systems that allow you to win this game with, say, 80%, then you might think, okay, how can I explain this violation? And one way of trying to explain it would be to introduce uh, the idea of this hidden variable that allows Alice and Bob to have stronger correlations that they would have otherwise. What we know now, according to claim three, is that this does not explain a violation of the 75% bound, because even if you allow for such a variable, 75% bound still holds. Okay? But if you, if you have not known this beforehand, the hidden variable might have been introduced to you as a potential solution, and then you see whether this is a good explanation or not. There was a question. Um, why is that local? Like well, okay, local is coming in a second. So. Yes, I, I'm going to say why it's called local hidden variable model. So I've now explained the term hidden variable. Uh, well, model, I don't need to explain. <laughs> um, and then there is this local part. And the model is local in the following sense. Um, so Alice and Bob, in this model here, Alice needs to decide on her output only given the question x that is sent to her and the random variable lambda that is maybe available to her or to her device. So only local information is used to determine her output. And likewise, Bob may only use local information to determine his output. And the model is local in this sense. So Alice can only use x and lambda to determine, or to produce, actually, a. And likewise, and uh, so the same for Bob. And it is also local, so now maybe local also in the sense that that's a, a quite an important ingredient to, call, to, to be able to call it local, right? If Lambda was able to give information to Alice about Bob's question and vice versa, then you could not, no longer really call it local. So at least intuitively this would violate your, um, your I hope this would violate your intuition of what is called local. Okay, so that is an important ingredient for this hidden variable to, to satisfy. Good, and then I also dropped the term local realism, and I should make clear how this is connected to these LHV models. So what is called local hidden variable model is sometimes also called uh, local realism, but I prefer the term local hidden variable model because, at least in this setting, it is extremely clear what is meant. I have 100% uniquely defined what a local hidden variable model is, when you start talking to philosophers about local realism, they will not talk about this thing here, most likely. They will talk about some other ideas, and I'm not saying that doesn't make sense, but not as formal, okay? So this is sometimes called local, locally realistic model, um, but depending on who you talk to, locally, local realism has different tastes, whereas I would say that this is well-defined. Yes, Lam why is lambda not local? Because, it, because it's distributed to two parties. But, okay, the point is not that, I'm not saying lambda, well, n I never said lambda is local, right? I said the model is local, and the model is a hidden variable model that is local. All right? And what, what needs to be satisfied is, first of all, it needs to respect the rules of the game, sloppily speaking, and Alice and Bob need to decide on their outputs locally, given the information they have on, uh, there in their lab. Okay. Um, good. So we conclude that... So this is sort of a, another, a, a restatement of claim three. Any strategy that allows for a local hidden variable model
to explain the correlations P A B given X Y must satisfy claim three. Namely, that the winning probability is upper bounded by 75%. And I'm restating this. So we, we have actually already stated this, but now with the new terminology, I've restated this because this is the main ingredient to connecting these games to, to the discussion of non-locality. So the question is always, can the correlations that you see in an experiment, can they be explained with a local hidden variable model or not? And it gets very interesting once this is no longer the case. Um, okay, and now, I'd, so I've already broadened the scope of the discussion a bit in the first hour when we started to discuss uh, obvious ways of generalizing this, uh, this rules, the rules of the game. Now I'd like to broaden the scope even more and, and see what is, what is this type of inequality in essence and... Um, and what is actually a bell inequality? So, making sort of a note for that. Um, so, in essence, this is what is it? Well, it's it's an inequality that's obvious, and in fact, it's an inequality that is linear in the correlations, because p a b given x y only shows up linearly in this in this inequality. So is a linear inequality in P A B given X Y, so in the correlations. And when people speak about Bell inequalities, um, because John Bell was the first one to investigate this thoroughly, when people speak about Bell inequalities, what they mean is some linear inequality in the correlations PAB given XY that bounds what is possible with local hidden variable models, which is the case here, right? This is a bound on what is possible with local hidden variable models, and it's a bound in terms of a linear inequality in PAB given XY. Um, so Bell inequalities... are linear inequalities in P, A, B, given X, Y, in principle allowing for more than local hidden variable models, but such that the inequality bounds what is possible with local hidden variable models. So it's giving either an upper or lower bound on local hidden variable models. So in this sense, Bell inequalities separate local hidden variable models from other types of correlations. Um. Still have 20 minutes, huh? Right, I do. Okay. Good. And now, uh, of course, now playing around with the rules of the game, as I have uh, indicated before, will give you different inequalities of the winning, in, in our case, of the winning probability. But you're not, you're actually not limited to only consider winning probabilities. You could consider arbitrary linear inequalities in in the correlations. But at least in the setting of the game, you, you care about the winning probability. So different games, different rules of the games, different settings give you different, um, different inequalities. In that sense, different Bell inequalities. Whether this inequality will be meaningful in the sense that it's also really useful in separating what is possible with local hidden variable models from other types of correlations depends a lot on the choice of the rules, right? You could easily define a game that is... Um, uh, that, that has winning probability of one 
all the time. For instance, the game is very easy. Alice and Bob get two questions, and the goal is that they always output the same. That's the winning condition. So independent of the questions, they will always output zero. You, you get an inequality. It's somewhat a bell inequality, but you already go to the very maximum, so you don't you don't really. It's not. It's not a. Tri it's a. It's a trivial bell inequality in this sense. So coming up with non-trivial bell inequalities is really connected to coming up with interesting winning conditions, which sort of connects to Colin's question from beforehand. So the winning condition is the essence of how how this um, um, CHSH game and also the inequality associated with it allows us to separate what is possible with a local hidden variable model from, as we will see in a second, quantum strategies. And in order to... Um, give you an explicit connection of this type of the CHSH inequality to what you may have seen beforehand, sort of, sort of the usual type of the CHSH inequality. I'd like to make this explicit, so that helps you to connect what you see here to maybe what you read in a paper, and also what you will see in the exercises on the sheet of this week. So that is a, a second note. <coughs> um, so, in fact, defining... Um, following the following random variables, A superscript X as um, plus one if the output should be zero and minus one if the output should be one. So given a question X, there are two different random variables. There is A zero and A one, depending on the question, right? And then if the output of Alice should be zero, then a x, whatever x was, will take the value plus one, and if the output was supposed to be one, then a x will take the value minus one. It's sort of a redefinition of the alphabet zero and one to plus and minus one. And likewise, you could define another random variable, b y, in the very same way. It's plus one or minus one, depending on b being zero or one, given the question y. And if you define it as such, then the winning probability it, there, it can be rewritten in terms of these uh, random variables and specifically in terms of expectation values of these random variables. There is, um, well, in principle you have all the ingredients, but I, I did it yesterday again calculating this stuff and it took me maybe two, three pages to do it properly because there are like 16 terms you need to juggle with. Right, but but it works. So I'm just going to give you again what this is going to be. So you can rewrite the winning probability in terms of these new random variables as the expectation value of E0 times B0 plus E1 times B0 plus A, sorry, A0, B1 minus A1, B1. Um, okay, where does the one half come from? When you when you rearrange the terms of the winning probability of the original case and you rewrite this in terms of 16 terms, then you will find that um, so essentially if you have two probabilities that need to sum up to one, you can you can replace one of them by one minus the other one. Okay, so if, if one is equal to p plus q, then you can replace q as one minus p. And if you do this in the right way, then this is essentially what leads to the one half in the calculation. But then, um, yeah. So the reason I'm saying this is because now the inequality that I called a version of the of the CHSH inequality is now true if and only if this guy here, so the expectation value a1 times b1, and so on. This is the case if and only if this is upper bounded by 2. And this is sometimes called the usual CHSH inequality. So who has, who has seen this type of inequality beforehand? 
right? So you have seen this. Who has seen this winning probability type of CHSH? Also, okay. But so I'm, now I made this connection explicit. It's the same inequality phrased in different terms. And the connection goes via the definition of these random variables AX and PY. Okay. So this is what is typically called, or say traditional, the traditional CHSH inequality, which is also why I called claim three only a version. And the CHSH inequality is some call, sometimes also called the Bell inequality. So when, 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 when a layman says the Bell inequality, they almost certainly mean the CHSH inequality. Okay, and um, that's actually good to know for the exercise sheets because in the exercise sheets you will play with, with this inequality here and you will see what quantum strategies can uh, violate this bound. And by violating this bound and this equivalence here, you also violate this bound so somewhat. Okay. Good. How is this done? So... Um, Without doing the calculation, because that is, that is essentially left to you, I can still give you the idea of what a quantum strategy is and, um, and tell you essentially what the result is going to be. Okay. The question is, can we do better with quantum resources? And the answer is going to be, going to be yes. So what are quantum resources? So with quantum resources, Alice and Bob can do the following. They can meet beforehand. They can prepare two systems, Alice system and Bob system, in a specific quantum state. Then they go apart and play the game. And they can make use of quantum measurements on their systems that determine their outcomes that they will send back to the referee. So essentially what, what this means is that they share a quantum state rho AB, which is a density operator of some bipartite Hilbert space HA tensor HB. And they can choose local measurements Depending on the questions, so depending on the question, they can, they can do different measurements on their part of the state to determine the outputs or the answers in that sense. Um, and specifically, the local measurements um, are essentially POVMs, so positive operator valued measures. Who, is, who knows the definition of a POVM? Most. Okay. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to write it down again. It's sort of a, the most general type of quantum measurement. It includes, in particular, projective measurements, but it allows for, say, some post-processing of the outcomes as well and includes them all in one object, which is very nice. Um, so this means they can choose POVMs. So these are Hermitian operators, in our case with two indices, A and X, and likewise B and Y. Um, so the POVMs, so the measurements, okay, let me, let me first define what the POVM is. Um, POVM is, is essentially without the, the, the uppercase index, it is a set of permission operators. Now in our case here of some, some Hilbert space H, such that all these operators are positive. So 
for all a, this is a positive operator, and they sum up to the identity. So if you sum up over all a's, then you get the identity. Okay. So an easy example of a POVM is a projective measurement because projectors are positive operators, and in a projective measurement, if you sum up all projectors, you must get the identity. Okay. But this allows for more than projective measurements. Good. And by saying that Alice and Bob choose each one, a local measurement, depending on the questions, um, what we say is that, so Alice chooses a P of M, so a set of positive operators that sum up to the identity, depending on the question. And likewise, Bob chooses this, um, a set of positive operators that sum up to the identity, so a P of M, depending on the questions. So the, the, there are different POVMs depending on the questions. Okay. So like if Alice gets the question zero, she will measure in the zero one basis. If Alice gets the question one, she will measure in the plus minus basis. That is one example. And likewise, Bob could choose different bases in which he measures. Um, perfect. All right. Um, I have to say I'm looking forward to the blackboard tomorrow. Much more convenient to clean. For my taste, also to, to write, but yeah, it's uh, it's a matter of taste. But I don't get why anyone ever started with whiteboards. So. Good. Um, so I have defined what a, what a quantum resources are. Now I have to say I have to tell you how to determine the correlations given some quantum resources. But that's something you know very well, because quantum correlations in the sense of um, a conditional probability distributions, P, A, B, given X, Y, can now be calculated given the state and the P of EMs. So they are now calculated as P, A, B, given X, Y, of answers A and B and questions X and Y, as, well, the probability of measuring outcome A, given question X, and outcome B, given question Y, this is um, the trace of row AB times the P of M elements EXA tensor F Y B. Right, so again, if you're not familiar with P of EMs and think of these objects here as a projector, then you have a projector tensor projector. In total, it's again a projector. <coughs> so essentially, Calculate the trace of the state times the projector. This is Born's rule to calculate outcome probabilities of quantum measurements. There was a question. No. All right, okay. Good. And now, <coughs> if, if I did the calculation with you or for you, what I would now do is I would give you a state. I would give you the two P of EMs, we would together calculate the correlations, and then we would, we would together calculate the winning probability, and we would see that choosing, making the right decisions, we get a winning probability above 75%. Now, we're not doing this together, but you're doing this in the, in the sheet, essentially. Um, but still, I can highlight the, <coughs> um, the main ingredients to this. So you will investigate In, I think, sheet seven, is it right? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, first of all, a two qubit system. So Alice and Bob have one qubit each, which is sort of the minimal quantum resource you could think of that is, that is non trivial. Uh, in, in addition, they have a pure state. That's another simplification.
And even better, even though I spoke about POVMs here, projective measurements are going to be <coughs> enough. So projective measurements are good enough. And they actually suffice to maximally violate the CHSH inequality. with quantum resources. <clears throat> um, at this point, it's not yet clear what maximally with quantum resources means, but we will see that, see, see later what this means. Actually, tomorrow. <clears throat> um, and the value that you will find for the winning probability is going to be one half times one plus one over square root of two, which is more or less 86%, obviously more than 75. And this corresponds to a value of, um, of this expectation value in this, in this like traditional formulation of the CHSH inequality. So traditional formulation of a value of two times square root of two. I think this is what you will, what you will be showing. <clears throat> so we conclude that quantum strategies can violate the CHSH bound, and in particular, quantum strategies can therefore not be explained by a local hidden variable model. That is the main punchline, essentially. So if you find correlations, if you're able to produce correlations in in reality, that violate the CHSH bound, then by the statement that we have had up there, we must conclude that these correlations, and in this case, the underlying theory is quantum theory, so in particular quantum theory, does not allow for a local hidden variable model. to explain the produced correlations. And in fact, this has been demonstrated in um, uh, 2015 for the first time, closing all the loopholes, and, and um, a convincing experimental demonstration of a violation of a Bell inequality, in particular the CHS inequality, consequently shows that, in that sense, the world is not locally realistic. Okay? Because if it was, it would have to satisfy all the inequalities, in particular the CHSH inequality. There was a question, yes. Mm -hmm. Good question, okay. So, I, I, I didn't say anything about entanglement so far, right? So, it turns out that if this state was separable, so not entangled, then, you, of course, you still calculate the correlations like this, and you will never violate any, any Bell inequality. So entanglement is an, uh, a necessary resource to violate Bell inequalities in general. There are settings, much more complicated settings than what we have seen here in this game, uh, maybe with more players, maybe with more questions, and maybe um, uh, questions one sent after the other. Okay, so Alice and Bob get, say, five questions, but they have to decide on the, on the first half of the output after they have received two questions, and then they receive the other three questions later on, and so on. And then if you go to these very complicated settings, then suddenly some separable states may show quantum behavior that cannot be explained classically. But this is much more complicated and we can also discuss whether, whether these types of investigations are still like as profoundly relevant as what we discuss here. So here, the answer is, without entanglement, no violation. Other questions? <coughs> yes, yeah. Um, 
<laughs> okay. So the question is, can we quantify some amount of entanglement given this equality? So, so to some extent, yes. Because what I've told you in, in the previous question is that at least in a binary question answer way, the answer is if you do not violate this. Um, okay, so the answer would be if you violate this inequality, then some entanglement must have been present. Okay, uh, if you don't violate this inequality, maybe you're just not clever enough. You may have had entanglement, but you didn't use it. That's another option, right? Now, um, in this specific inequality, it's actually a quite interesting link between entanglement and uh, and the violation because. It's, it's a very special one also, the CHSH one. Because if you, if you reach the maximum violation, so here the 2 times square root of 2 in the case of the random variable formulation or these uh, approximately 86% in the case of the winning probability formulation, then it is possible to deduce that the states that you have worked with must have been maximally entangled in terms of a 2 qubit um, state. Or if you had bigger systems, that the bigger systems must have had a subspace, which are a qubit in Alice and a qubit in Bob's bigger system, that are equivalent to a maximally entangled state. But that is an extremely strong result. And it only works for very specific Bell inequalities. So if you go to other types of Bell inequalities, maximum violation does not necessarily allow you to deduce the type of entanglement. But in this case, there is a very profound relation between the entanglement that you're actually having and the, the violation of the Bell inequality. Yes. Yes. Very good question, thanks. Um, yes, so um, I think I'm already over time. So let me just quickly say what we do tomorrow. Tomorrow we will um, wrap up what we, what we have started today. Okay, so we will um, again have a look at, at this maximum violation. We'll see what it means to maximally violate the Bell inequality with quantum resources. We will also discuss whether you could think of yet super quantum resources that go even beyond this winning probability of 86%. And we will quickly discuss um, experimental implementations and, and, and difficulties in experimental implementations of, of uh, say, tests of Bell inequalities of this type. Okay, see you tomorrow. <laughs>